Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very pleased that Sitan Chen in California has got up so early in the morning. And Sitan was an undergraduate at Harvard, graduate student at MIT, and now is a postdoctoral fellow at Berkeley. And he's going to tell us about learning polynomial transformations. So Sitan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much Sarah, for, for the introduction. So I'll be talking about uh, joint work with uh, Jerry Lee, Yuan Zhe Li, and Andrew Zhang on learning polynomial transformations. Broadly speaking, this work is inspired by the tremendous strides that have been made by practitioners in the study of deep generative models, uh, which provide a powerful framework for capturing real world high dimensional distributions. Um, many of you have probably seen images like these. These are pictures of people and objects that don't actually exist output by some deep generative model that was trained to be able to sample in some sense from the distribution over real world images. Now what's great about these models is that not only are they capable of generating hyper-realistic and diverse images like these, but they also serve as an important building block for other downstream applications like semantic image synthesis in painting and much more. Now, while these models are wildly successful in practice, the truth is that we know very little about why this is the case or even how to quantify what it is they're actually accomplishing. So in this talk, instead of focusing on these applications, uh, my goal is really to take a deep dive into framing these questions from a theory standpoint and reporting on some of the first steps uh, towards building a principal theory for generative models. Okay, so what is a generative model? The guiding idea behind a number of popular frameworks for deep generative modeling is the following. It's that push forwards of simple distributions, for instance, Gaussian, under neural networks are one, highly expressive, in the sense that they can capture these kinds of real world distributions. And two, heuristically easy to optimize over in the sense that we have a variety of you know, uh, tricks in practice for actually you know, searching for the best neural network that can approximate a particular distribution. Okay, so I wanna sort of just uh, make sure we're on the same page. So just to be more concrete, uh, we can think of a deep generative model as being parametrized by some function f. You can think of it as maybe just a neural network. Um, and the goal uh, in deep generative modeling is really given samples from some real world distribution D, produce some network F for which the push forward, which I'll denote by F of Gaussian, approximates D. All right, so what do I mean by F of Gaussian? So this is the distribution that you can sample from as follows. To draw a sample, nature is going to sample some Gaussian vector G, say in R dimensions, and what we observe is the output of uh, you know, the neural network F under the input G. Okay, so I should stress that we in this entire process do not observe the latent variable G, we only observe the sample X. Okay, so this is what I mean by the push forward distribution. Um, and so how do people try solving this in practice? So I'll just use uh, a particular framework, uh, generative adversarial networks as a concrete example. Um, so, so GANs try to do this as follows. They consider the following adversarial loss where you minimize over your generator, F, um, the following quantity, which you can think of as some kind of neural network approximation to Wasserstein distance, okay? So you wanna maximize over uh, say neural networks A that we'll call the discriminator, the following quantity that kind of measures the discrepancy as determined by the discriminator between the samples you've generated using your generator and the true samples from the true distribution. Okay. And so this is just the absolute difference between the expectation under the true distribution of what the discriminator computes and the expectation under your distribution, F of Gaussian, of what the discriminator computes. And the hope is that you can come up with some kind of generator for which this, this overall minimax quantity is very small. Okay, so this is just one example of what practitioners try to do in order to solve this, this question of learning the underlying distribution D by outputting a generative model F. Okay, so needless to say, there are a number of sort of uh, theoretical mysteries underlying not only, you know, this particular approach to distribution learning, but even just the more general question of whether uh, the distribution learning question is possible under any algorithm. Okay, so in this talk, we'll, you know, make our lives much easier and say, um, let's imagine that any real world distribution can actually be exactly representable by a push forward. In other words, I'm not gonna worry about any issues of proximability. I'm just gonna assume that there is some unknown neural network F star for which the true distribution over images, say 
is given by F star of Gaussian. And my goal is really to try to uh, recover F star either in some parameter sense or in some distributional sense. Okay, so the first question you can ask is, um, well, uh, at least for these particular heuristics like GANs and also things like variational autoencoders, they all put forth uh, certain objectives that they'd like to minimize like this particular adversarial loss for GANs. Um, and, you know, of course you can't in principle uh, achieve some kind of minimax solution to this problem uh, without some, you know, some collection of approximations. So in practice, of course, you can't actually hope to work directly with these population expectations. You really have to just work with an average over some batch of samples. Um, likewise, you know, you can't actually hope to, you know, globally optimize this objective. Um, so instead, in practice, uh, you know, we typically use local methods like stochastic gradient descent, ascent, um, where you, you know, you typically alternate between optimizing either your generator F or your discriminator A. Can you say how good an, uh, an assumption this is? Um, oh, oh, the um, the approximability of a distribution by a push forward. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so um, in general, uh, you know, neural networks are well known to have sort of universal approximability uh, capabilities. So with sufficiently many, let's say some large polynomial number of parameters, uh, this is a very reasonable assumption, at least in terms of getting some maybe inverse polynomial approximation accuracy. Um, of course, whether it's exactly representable is, is, a, is a dicier question. Um, but what we'll see later is that the algorithms I'm going to propose are, are fairly robust to at least um, you know, inverse polynomial additive noise. Um, so this is really more for uh, kind of like an aesthetic choice. Um, but uh, in some sense, because the family of neural networks is so expressive in, uh, in terms of capturing real world functions, Oh, sorry, yeah, real value functions, um, it's, uh, it's fairly reasonable. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, you know, what, what are issues that arise when you, when you try performing these heuristic approximations? Um, well, just like in the supervised machine learning uh, literature, there's the whole issue where because you're optimizing over the weights of a neural network and you're intrinsically working with a non-convex objective, in this case, it's uh, you know because we're both minimizing over a generator and maximizing over a discriminator. You know this is a non-convex concave objective, and um, you know one way to think about the difficulties that are involved here is that you know it's already very difficult to analyze something like backpropagation in a supervised setting, let alone backpropagation with this kind of game theoretic twist, where now you sort of have to you know uh, work with this two-player game where you have to minimize and maximize simultaneously. Um, some issues that arise not only in the analysis of, uh, you know, heuristics for solving this problem, but even in, you know, training in practice itself is that, uh, for instance, you know, as your generator gets better and better, the amount of feedback that you get from your discriminator gets less and less because the discriminator is, um, you know, not going to do as good of a job of being able to tell apart the images you generate versus the true images. And so you get issues with things like vanishing gradients. You can even get uh, sort of oscillatory behavior in the training dynamics. And you could also get things like mode collapse where the distribution you end up learning ends up collapsing to just a small, um, you know, a, a bunch of bumps around a small collection of points. Um, and, you know, from a generalization perspective, you know, this issue of replacing, you know, uh, an expectation with a sample average um, can arise, uh, you know, in very, from, from a very um, uh, simple collection of principles. So it was shown by Aurora et al that you know, if the family of discriminators that you're working with is limited in capacity, say it has a, a small number of weights, um, that even if you manage to, you know, successfully train in the sense that your training objective is actually quite small, you know, when these, these expectations are replaced by sample averages, the final generator that you come up with, again, may have small support size. And this is really just by a simple, like, turn off union bound kind of argument. Okay, so in other words, <clears throat> the heuristics for training these kinds of general models are actually not exactly aligned with the overall goal of, you know, minimizing the objective that you put out, put forth. Okay, so that's fine and all that. This is an issue with generalization, but you could take a step back and ask like, okay, what if I, you know, generalize properly? What if I find a globally, you know, minimax optimal solution to this objective? Is that good enough for distribution learning? And, you know, here there's still more bad news from the perspective of theory 
Um, so in joint work with Jerry Lee, Yuan Zhu Lee, and Ragu Mecca, we showed that actually for a large family of natural F stars, you know, that generate the true distribution, there exists pathological networks F, which optimize this, you know, this population objective at the top, but for which the distribution that you generate versus the distribution that, you know, you got samples from are actually far in a statistical sense. And this is, you know, I, with the caveat, this is under a standard cryptographic assumption about pseudorandom generators. And just to give you a sense for why this is true, you know, if you've, um, if you've seen things like pseudorandom generators from complexity theory, this shouldn't actually be that surprising. You know, what is a pseudorandom generator? It's, you know, a function that takes a small number of uniform bits and stretches it into a distribution that looks like the uniform distribution over a larger number of bits in a computational sense, but not in a statistical sense. In other words, no computationally bounded algorithm will be able to tell apart your pseudo-random generator's output from a truly random output, even though these two output distributions are actually far in the sense of probability distributions. And so this is really like the sort of phenomenon that's underlying this, this negative results uh, mentioned here. There are some other tricks that you need to work, uh, you need to work in in order to handle continuous distributions, distributions realized by you know, continuous push forwards. But this is so, somehow like the fundamental phenomenon that's um, that speaking, to so what kind of like uh, discrimi discrimination are you used in your theorem? Great, yeah. So, um, so we're working with uh, arbitrary polynomial sized polynomial depth uh, ReLU, uh, uh, ReLU networks um, oh. with, with polynomial Lipschitzness. Yeah. yeah. So, so how, 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 how large is the size of the West? The width, I mean, all these parameters are, let's say, some polynomial. The, the, the standard, the cryptographic assumption is that no, um, let's say, polynomially bounded adversary can mm -hmm. distinguish between um, the, uh, you know, the output of a pseudo random generator versus uh, uniform distribution over, over bits. So whatever choice of polynomial is defined by this lower bound, you can correspondingly take the size of the network to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, great question. Okay, so you know this seems like bad news. Um, not only are you know these training heuristics uh, you know both difficult to implement and difficult to analyze, but you know even if I had uh, you know a, a, a truly like minimax optimal solution to this, it could still be spurious and it could not correspond to distribution learning. And so we could pop one more layer up the abstraction hierarchy and just ask: Is there any algorithm that can provably learn these kinds of distributions? In practice, there are often you know issues with you know, how to actually evaluate how well a trained model has learned the distribution. This is in stark contrast to supervised settings where you get, you know, labeled images and, you know, a simple baseline or a simple benchmark for testing how well you've done is something like measuring your test accuracy. And so as a result, uh, in this literature, there are a variety of heuristics that people have proposed to sort of at least be able to compare different generative models in terms of performance. Um, the most labor intensive would be to simply manually inspect your generated examples and make sure that you haven't just simply memorized the training examples that you were, that you were trained on. Um, you know, something you would like to do is estimate something like the log likelihood of the held out test data that you're working with. This would be somehow like the distributional or the unsupervised analog of test accuracy. And the issue is that estimating the log likelihood involves estimating some partition function. And so computationally, it's intractable and we need various heuristics like simulated annealing. And perhaps the most popular uh, uh, metrics for determining you know, how well a trained model has learned the distribution are things like the inception score and the Frechet inception distance. Um, these are actually based on a particular pre-trained image classifier, inception v3. Um, so just to give a sense for what these are, like the Frechet inception distance you know, takes uh, this inception v3 network and it passes in random examples that you've generated versus random examples uh, you know, from the true distribution and looks at the sort of neural features computed uh, at some high, like you know, one of the upper layers of um, the inception network and tries to compare them in some, in some distributional distance. Okay. So these are, you know, as you can tell, like purely heuristic in the sense that you know, I, they just picked some arbitrary image classifier. And you know, the reason people work with this is that it seems to be you know, uh, reasonably correlated with human perception in terms of you know, quality of the, the images being generated. Um, but at the end of the day, they don't come with any kinds of rigorous guarantees on you know, how good of a job the, the learning algorithm actually did. So in contrast, I wanna uh, also point out that you know, this, uh, 
this can also be seen as sort of like a natural you know, next step in this long line of work from a different literature, namely theoretical computer science and also um, much of the statistics literature um, on designing algorithms with provable guarantees for learning high dimensional distributions from samples. Um, so certain uh, models that have been popular in this literature have been things like you know, Gaussian mixture models as sort of like a, a, a basic uh, toy model for, uh, for uh, studying things like clustering. Um, of course, graphical models, um, topic modeling, and, um, and one particular uh, sub area of problems called independent component analysis, which you can kind of think of as sort of the linear regime for learning push forwards. Independent component analysis is really the question of given not like a Gaussian, but some highly non Gaussian input distribution, we observe samples of that distribution under some linear function rather than some highly nonlinear one. And you'd like to recover, um, you know, the parameters of this linear transformation. Okay, so uh, you can think of, you know, learning push forwards by neural networks as really, you know, this this nice marriage between the sorts of practical motivations that people have when they study distribution learning, you know, in the wild, and these kinds of uh, fundamental questions that uh, theoreticians like to ask about learnability of distributions. So uh, let me, you know, um, that's sort of like the high level motivation for this work. Let me now sort of go into the, you know, the details of, of how we actually formulate this question and what kinds of results we show. Okay, so, so just to remind ourselves, um, again, the deep generative model is just, you know, some push forward under, in this case, an unknown neural network F star that parametrizes, you know, the distribution that we get out of nature. And our goal is to come up with some generator F for which f of Gaussian is close to this uh, f star of Gaussian. Um, in some statistical sense, let's say Wasserstein. Okay. Um, and in fact, in this work, we're gonna consider an even stronger recovery guarantee. Um, we're not just going to try to approximate the true distribution uh, in a statistical sense. We're actually going to try, you know, literally recovering the unknown parameters of f star up to some error modulo the natural symmetries. Okay. Um, and it, you know, it turns out that uh, analyzing uh, you know deep neural networks with radial activations is actually you know uh, quite analytically challenging. Um, so as a first step, we're going to consider um, you know activations that are given by polynomials. Um, so concretely, we're going to focus on functions f star, uh, which are parametrized by you know a collection of d low degree polynomials in R variables, and we'll call them p1 through pd. Um, you know, in in deep learning uh, lingo, this is really just the depth two neural network with polynomial activations. And it actually turns out that with polynomial activations, you can still get like kind of blurry images, definitely not as high quality as the ones that we saw in the, in the earlier slides. Um, but I, th I think of this as like a natural first step towards understanding this general family of learning questions. So, okay, so let's focus on polynomials. So what do I really mean by recovering the parameters of F star? You know, given the samples of F star Gaussian, you know, uh, one natural thing you could hope to do is actually literally recover all the coefficients of P1 through PD. Um, so let's, let's try to unpack what that would mean um, in the degree two case. So let's imagine that uh, actually P1 through BD are just quadratic forms. So I can identify every polynomial with, you know, it's coefficient matrix, uh, Q of A. Uh, this is some R by R symmetric matrix. And so one natural symmetry that you'll notice is that because the input distribution, which is Gaussian, is rotation invariant, I can't actually hope to recover the, the QAs uh, exactly. Indeed, there is a, a natural gauge symmetry where for any you know, R by R rotation matrix U, the push forward defined by Q of A and the push forward defined by this rotation of Q of A by U give rise to the exact same push forward distribution, right? I might as well have taken my, my input, which was the Gaussian vector, randomly rotated it and then pushed it through my polynomial, and I would have gotten the same overall distribution um, as my push forward. Now, the good news is that in the quadratic case, this is actually the only symmetry. And so we can raise this question of recovering the parameters of a quadratic push forward to within sufficient accuracy as really saying, I would like to output a collection of matrices q hat one to q hat d, for which the Frobenius uh, distance between the best alignment of Q of A with Q hat A is small. 
So we're minimizing over rotations u, the maximum over all your matrices from one to d of the Frobenius norm between uh, uqa, u transpose, and q hat a. Okay, so in other words, we're just asking for some kind of L2 recovery modulo this gauge symmetry. Okay, and you can, you can extend this to uh, higher degrees. So instead of focusing on quadratic, you know, what if uh, the degree of the polynomials is unbounded? Then we can still identify every polynomial, of course, with not a symmetric matrix, but a symmetric tensor. Um, you know, you could replace the notion of, uh, you know, uh, conjugating by U by some higher order notion of conjugation. Um, you know, you can write this down in coordinates, but the details aren't super important. Just think of this as sort of a higher order analog of taking, you know, left and right multiplying by U. And, uh, you know, you can, re you can rephrase the parameter recovery question in the higher degree case uh, in a completely analogous fashion. Again, we want to just find, you know, the best alignment between your estimate, which is t hat, and the true, uh, the ground truth, which is ta, and you want to make sure that the distance between these two aligned tensors is small. Um, the bad news is that in the higher degree case, this is actually not the only symmetry. Uh, that gauge symmetry isn't the only symmetry. Um, and in fact, it was shown, it was observed by Grunbaum, um, you know, several decades ago that. Uh, you know, here are just these two simple bivariate polynomials, P and Q, um, such that the push forward of the two dimensional Gaussian under P is identical to the push forward of the two dimensional Gaussian under Q, but for which P and Q aren't actually related up to a gauge symmetry. Okay, so this makes uh, you know, life uh, pretty difficult. Um, here's another piece of bad news. This parameter recovery question, even in the quadratic case, turns out to have a fundamental information theoretic lower bound. Um, so even in the one dimensional setting, uh, when uh, the degree is two, parameter recovery, even up to some constant accuracy, you can show requires exponential in the input dimension, number of samples in the worst case. Another way of thinking of the, about this is that there exist push forward distributions with very different parameters, but which are exponentially close in statistical distance. Okay, so it turns out, however, that this lower bound instance is quite delicate. Um, it involves certain moment matching uh, constructions, actually also like a topological fixed point argument that, you know, certainly real world distributions are not running. Um, so the good news is that real world distributions will sort of avoid these kinds of worst case lower bounds. And so you can ask, you know, is this question that we put forth actually tractable for non worst case push forward distributions? And there's a you know a very old idea in theoretical career science that um, gives a way of you know rigorously reasoning about these kinds of questions. Okay, so the intuition, of course, is that you know in general these kinds of hard examples are quite pathological, and even if you just write randomly perturb these hard examples slightly, they become tractable. So one one way of visualizing this is that you know maybe here is the landscape uh, in terms of computational complexity of um, you know um, various instances of this push forward learning problem. And maybe you see some spikes, some isolated spikes where the problem instance is actually you know, um, very hard, either from a statistical standpoint or from a computational standpoint. But the point is that if I add a little bit of noise to the parameters defining any particular uh, spike, I'm essentially sort of like smoothing it with its neighbors in this landscape. And so the resulting landscape I get when I measure in terms of the expected time complexity where the expectation is over the perturbation, then all of a sudden the complexity of this landscape becomes much nicer. And so this is sort of the, the framework we'll work with. We're going to consider smooth instances. So in the quadratic case, we'll consider quadratic forms Q1 through QD, which are given by starting with an arbitrary uh, collection of matrices, say Q tilde 1 to Q tilde D, and then randomly perturbing every entry by an inverse polynomial amount. I want to emphasize this is more challenging than sort of traditional average case settings that might have been studied in, in say probability, uh, where you focus on maybe like a Gaussian matrix QA. Um, here we're really taking any worst case uh, matrix and perturbing it around uh, in a neighborhood around that particular instance. Okay, so so this is this is sort of like the distribu distributional model we'll consider. Um, so here's what we show. 
So the first result is in the quadratic setting. Um, here we should we give an algorithm for provably recovering the parameters of any smooth push forward um, using a polynomial number of uh, samples and polynomial runtime where the polynomial dependence is in all parameters. And the only caveat is that we need that the output dimension is sufficiently large relative to the input dimension. Now, in fact, this quadratic relationship between uh, D and R is um, uh, roughly the kind of quantitative uh, relation that you'll see in practice in terms of output dimension versus input dimension. Um, and you can interpret this as really uh, in line with this hypothesis that real world images um, tend to be supported on maybe like some kind of low dimensional manifold. Let me also just emphasize that this is the first sort of end to end provable algorithmic results for learning a family of push forwards computed by a neural network with more than one layer. And the second set of results is that, you know, if I go beyond this quadratic setting, so I still get an algorithm. Yes. Could, could you explain what capital Omega is? Oh, sorry. Yes. yes. Um, uh, capital. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'm using uh, some TCS. Uh, so big O notation, uh, capital Omega is just that there is some absolute constant C for which D is at least C R squared. It's like the opposite of big O. And, and how does epsilon enter the right hand side? Um, the, oh, um, so there is no depends on epsilon in the lower bound uh, on, on D. Um, in, in essence, like the lower bound on D is just so that the collection of um, matrices Q1 through QD uh, sort of robustly spans the space of symmetric matrices. Um, yeah, and so epsilon here, uh, I, I forget if I, so, so epsilon is just um, the, the, let's say the, the parameter distance, so like this um, minimum, this minimax quantity over the rotation and the index of the Frobenius error. Um, yeah, so that'll enter into the sample complexity. Right. Great. Um, yeah, so we can show a, a, a sort of analogous result in the higher degree case um, uh, with one caveat. So here um, we work in the setting where you can think of the, so the generators, the polynomials, as sort of being of, of bounded width in some sense, um, in that the associated tensors corresponding to the polynomials are of low rank. Um, you know, in, in neural net parlance, this you can think of as each particular coordinate of, of the function is computed by, say, a small number of, of, of hidden units. Um, and uh, again, we need to make some kind of, uh, you know, lower bound assumption on the output dimension. Here, in analogy with the theorem that I showed on the previous slide, we need D large enough that all of the associated tensors, in some sense, robustly span the space of, um, you know, order omega tensors. Of, of rank L. Um, just as a technicality, let me mention that the smooth model that we work with in this low rank case is slightly different. Um, because we really care about this low rank structure, we're not going to just perturb every entry of every tensor. We're instead going to just perturb the rank one components individually. Okay, so actually one surprising upshot of this result, even just from a probabilistic perspective, is that this is really saying that when the polynomials uh, involved are actually low rank and sort of beyond worst case in some sense, then you avoid these pathological examples like the Grunbaum example that we saw earlier. Namely, uh, actually gauge symmetry is really the only symmetry when it comes to recovery, even in the high degree case. Okay, so I wanna tell you a bit about the techniques because I think it's um, uh, sort of an interesting in injection of ideas from theoretical computer science into this, into this distribution learning problem. Um, at a high level, this algorithm will be based on, um, you know, this common approach of, of method of moments. The idea that I want to look at sort of correlations between, um, you know, coordinates of my push forward distribution, um, maybe expectations of particular polynomials evaluated on this vector sample from the push forward. And based on these expected polynomials, um, I want to be able to, you know, back out information about the underlying parameters. So just make this concrete, you know, I can just look at something simple like the covariance between two coordinates of my push forward. And you can show you know, just some simple calculation that up to a constant factor, the covariance between say the a-th coordinate of your push forward and the b-th coordinate is nothing more than the trace inner product between the corresponding matrices. So one way to interpret this is really that the second order moments of this distribution, you know, these covariances, they already tell us some non-trivial information 
namely the angles between the different matrices, if you regard them not as matrices, but just as R squared dimensional vectors. So this is you know, some progress. This lets us recover these uh, matrices up to not the gauge symmetry that we wanted, but up to this bigger symmetry of a rotation in R squared dimensions. So in other words, we can recover the matrices, but we've now lost all of the matrix structure. And we just sort of know them as vectors. Of course, um, you know, we, we really want to recover up to this R by R rotation. And for this, we're going to have to look not just at the covariance, but at maybe higher order analogs of the covariance. So I can look at other kinds of statistics about the distribution. I can look at what's called the, you know, the third order cumulants of this distribution, which you can think of as just like the third order version of covariance. And so I can form these expectations just by you know, estimating them from, from samples. And you can show that up to a constant factor, these expectations are simply the trace of the product of three uh, matrices Q. So if I look at the third order cumulant among the coordinates A, B, and C, I get trace of QA, QB, QC. Let me emphasize that this is actually you know, uh, a permutation invariant quantity. If I, if I permute the A, B, and C, this is still the, um, the same quantity simply because when you're working with symmetric matrices, you get not only the standard cyclic symmetry for trace, but also the dihedral symmetry. Um, and so one nice thing is that actually this question of recovering the Qs from these trace QA, QB, QCs, this, is, uh, this goes by another name in a different uh, literature. This is actually called um, uh, symmetric tensor ring decomposition. Or in physics parlance, this is, this is nothing more than you know, decomposing uh, a matrix product state with periodic boundary condition. Another way of interpreting this particular recovery question is, well, when the Qs are actually diagonal, this is equivalent to another uh, inverse problem that's been well studied in the signal processing and statistics literature. This is something called tensor decomposition, um, which at a high level corresponds to, I give you the entries of some low rank tensor, and I'd like you to recover the, the rank one components of the tensor. So to see where that comes from, let's consider the following instance. So all the Qs now are diagonal. Let's define V1 to be the first entry, diagonal entry of every one of the Qs. Let's define V2 to be the second entry, V3, et cetera. Sorry, my slides are advancing really slowly. Um, right, so we can define all these uh, R different vectors in D dimensions, V1 through VR. And one simple observation is just that, you know, what is trace of QA, QB, QC? This is nothing more than the A, B, C of entry of this uh, low rank tensor, the sum over I of VI tensor three. So in other words, in order to recover the Qs from these trace terms, um, you simply need to solve this tensor decomposition question of recovering the Vs from this low rank tensor. Okay, so tensor ring decomposition, in other words, subsumes the question of tensor decomposition. Um, but of course, when the QAs are actually non-diagonal, then we don't have any provable guarantees that are known. And this is really the, the key technical challenge that we'll have to overcome. Now you could, you could say like a priori, it's not even clear whether just working with these low degree moments should be able to you know, allow you to recover Q of A up to gauge symmetry. There could be you know, many different candidate solutions that all have the same trace quantities, um, give rise to the same trace quantities, yet determine completely different distributions. And so the content of, this, uh, of our result in the quadratic case is really to say that these quantities trace Q A Q B and trace Q A Q B Q C these actually uniquely and robustly determine the parameters of the distribution up to the symmetry we want uh, in this smooth high dimensional setting. Okay, and just to um, underline this, this word robustly, um, by robustly determine, I really mean that you know, this holds even if um, we don't have these trace quantities exactly. Um, so for instance, if I have a collection of matrices Q1 through QD and another set of matrices Q hat one to Q hat D, and their trace quantities are all approximately the same, then there still exists some rotation that approximately aligns the QAs into the Q hat A's. So in, statist in statistics parlance, this is really saying that the degree at most three moments of a push forward computed by a quadratic network robustly identify the parameters of the network. Okay, so. Uh, you know, this is sort of the high level proof strategy. Um, now I need to sort of convince you that, you know, identifiability actually holds, that it suffices to 
you know, recover a collection of matrices for which these trace quantities actually match the true trace quantities given by the underlying distribution. So let's suppose I have two candidate sets of solutions um, that um, sort of match on these trace quantities. And again, I want to show that there exists some R by R rotation that aligns one set of solutions to the other. Let's recall that just by looking at the second order trace terms, I already get my matrices up to this big R squared by R squared rotation. Of course, the drawback being that I sort of lose all of this, this matrix structure. In other words, there exists some R squared by R squared orthogonal matrix for which uh, W times the flattening of Q of A equals the flattening of Q hat A. And when I mean flattening, I just mean I've smushed this matrix down into an R squared dimensional vector. Now, this isn't exactly what we want, but if we, if we knew that you could actually align Q of A with Q hat A using an R by R rotation U, then it's easy to check that W is simply the Kronecker product between U and itself. And the upshot of this would be that any column of W regarded now not as a R squared dimensional column vector, but as an R by R matrix will be rank one. Specifically, you know, the, the IJ of column of W would be the outer product between the ith column of u and the jth column of u. Okay, so the details of this aren't super important, but uh, suffice it to say that it's crucial that we establish not just that we have some matrix w, but really that its columns have this rank one structure. And so our goal will be to use these higher order moments, these third order trace terms, to prove that w indeed has this rank one structure. So let me just use sort of a cartoon to give you a sense for why uh, these third order terms are helpful. So you can think of these third order terms as really telling us not the angles between the Qs, but actually the angles between any Q and any product of Qs. So let's just imagine these Qs as, as vectors living in some, I mean, in this case, two-dimensional space. Okay, um, so the orange vectors are the Qs and the blue vector is the product of two Qs. And again, these trace terms give us sort of the inner products between any pair of blue and, and orange vectors. Similarly, um, the trace Q hat A, Q hat B, Q hat Cs tell us the angles between any Q hat A and every and any uh, product of Q hat B, Q hat C. So let's say I had you know, these two, Q hat one and Q hat two, there's some other orange vectors. And what we already know is that to get from Q one to Q hat one or from Q two to Q hat two, I just go along this rotation W. Now, the nice thing about knowing the angles between any pair of blue and orange vectors is that uh, this also means that this rotation W is also going to send this blue vector QBQC to Q hat B, Q hat C. Okay, so what have we gained? We've shown that W not only maps you know, QA to Q hat A, it also maps any product of Qs to any product of Q hats. Okay, so we can write this more compactly as follows in our you know, flattening notation. And now let's try to use this. Okay. So let's just consider a concrete example. Let's say the Qs actually consisted of standard based matrices. Uh, so EI, EJ transpose here just denotes the matrix whose i, -th, uh, whose entry in the ij, -th, uh, whose ij -th entry is one and all other entries are zero. In this case, equation one, tells us that you know, the Q hat A's consist of W times the standard basis matrix. And that's simply you know, some column of W. So all the Q hat A's are just columns of W uh, regarded now as R by R matrices. What about uh, constraint number two? Um, well, I could plug in for QB uh, some standard basis matrix. I can plug in for QC some other standard basis matrix. And I know that Q hat B and Q hat C are just the corresponding columns of W. Okay, now I can rewrite the left-hand side as just, you know, uh, you know, what is the product of two standard basis matrices? If J is equal to K, then this is just EI EL transpose. If J is not equal to K, this is just zero. So I can rewrite the left-hand side as follows. And you know, this is nothing more than the IL of column of W times this indicator function. Okay, so, We've deduced the following relation in this special case where the QAs consist of the standard basis matrices. And it turns out you can, you can still deduce these kinds of relations even for general QA, uh, simply because 
in some sense, ge for general QA, you can decompose them into the standard basis. And then these constraints above won't give you, uh, you know, this equation star immediately. They'll only give you linear combinations thereof. But if you have enough QAs and they're sufficiently random, then these linear combinations will actually imply the relation star. Okay, so let's just focus on these relations. You can think of this as some kind of like matrix multiplication constraints where, you know, WIJ and WKL, they're, you, you get sort of the, the outer indices only if the inner indices agree. And I claim that this, is, this relation is enough to conclude the proof. And the proof is, is actually just three lines. Okay, so I wanna show that the columns of W, if they satisfy these quadratic relations, then they're rank one. So, so here's the proof. Let's look at trace of WIJ, WIJ transpose regarded as matrices. Well, in the first step, I'm just using this relation above to say that WIJ is the same as WII times WIJ as matrices. Now I can just use Cauchy-Schwarz and split out the WII uh, and the other term WIJ, WIJ transpose. And finally, I recall that W is an R squared dimensional orthogonal matrix. And so all of its columns in particular have unit norm. So WII, Frobenius norm, is just one. Okay, so what have I done here? I've upper bounded the trace of a PSD matrix with the Frobenius norm. But of course, the reverse inequality always holds, which means I have an equality. And so what I've concluded is that, you know, the, the quantity, the, this quantity in this trace is actually a rank one matrix. So I've concluded that actually WIJ is rank one. Um, and this is exactly what we wanted. Of course, now you have to sort of finish up the proof by saying, well, it's a rank one matrix, but I actually have to insist that it's a, a Kronecker product of an R by R uh, rotation with itself. I won't go into the details of, of how to show this. I mean, this here, you really just follow your nose and use some elementary consequences of the above uh, relation to get this, this equality. Okay, so I wanna stress that this entire proof like uh, uh, only used extremely elementary algebraic manipulations. And you might wonder, well, I have this proof of identifiability now, but this is merely an inf information theoretic guarantee. Like it only tells me that if I managed to produce a collection of matrices whose trace quantities were all equal to the ground truth, then I'd be happy. Then, then this would be, uh, then I would have solved the problem. But it doesn't give me any way of actually recovering something for which the trace quantities agree. And I wanna say that actually the simplicity of the proof that I just told you, uh, almost in a mechanical fashion, yields uh, an algorithm for this problem that runs in polynomial time. So now I wanna say more about this. Um, Okay, so how do we actually get an algorithm out of all of this? Um, so, so far, what we've shown is that these trace quantities uniquely and robustly determine the parameters up to the symmetry we want. Um, let's first do a slight trick to break symmetry a bit. So as a consequence of this theorem, we also know that um, if I have you know, two candidate sets of solutions, QA and Q hat A, and I further assume that the Qs and the Q hats are diagonal with sorted entries, I can always assume this without loss of generality because, well, um, I only know the Qs up to gauge symmetry. I might as well put the Qs in uh, their eigenbasis. So if I make this additional assumption, which is without loss of generality, then because I know the Q and Q hat are aligned according to an R by R rotation, this actually means they're equal. Okay, so this is just a simple asymmetry breaking proof as a prelude to the actual algorithm. So what's the algorithm? Here's sort of uh, you know, the world's dumbest algorithm in terms of uh, you know, how to solve this problem. So I, I take as input you know, my estimates for these trace quantities. And again, I'm assuming without loss, loss of generality that Q1 is now in its eigenbasis and you know, it's, it's, it's sorted. Let's just consider the following polynomial program. I have as my variables, you know, my estimates for these Qs, these Q hat one through Q hat D. And I put in, you know, the simplest constraints one can imagine. I of course want that the Q hat A's are symmetric matrices. And I want that the trace quantities agree with the input. And I want to, you know, of course break symmetry by assuming that Q hat one is diagonal with sorted entries. And what I just showed you on the previous slide is that, you know, if I could find a solution to this program, then I'd be done. Then I would conclude that Q hat A, my solution, is actually equal to the true solution Q A. Uh, 
Now, of course, you might be thinking like solving a polynomial system in general is NP hard. Um, so we can't hope to do this in a black box fashion. So to get an efficient algorithm for this problem, we really need to use some kind of convex relaxation of this problem. And this is where this, this nice trick from theoretical computer science comes in. This is something called the sum of squares hierarchy. And um, I'm not gonna go into the sort of uh, technical weeds of you know, how this hierarchy is defined, but I wanna give you a, a sort of impression for um, the kinds of things you can do with this, this approach. So, so what is sum of squares? At a high level, I like to think of it as some kind of generic pipeline um, that allows you to convert proofs into algorithms. Okay, um, so you know it's this, this powerful generic framework that is very useful for algorithm design, especially in the context of non-convex optimization. The idea is, I have some inefficient algorithm like the one I showed you on the previous slide, and I have sort of a very elementary proof that it that it works. That if I found a solution to this gigantic polynomial program, then it has to be the correct solution. Now, the sum of squares pipeline really says, if you can come up with this box on the left, then it, in a mechanical fashion, gives you uh, the box on the right, namely an efficient algorithm with the exact same guarantees. And you know, this, this approach has been very powerful and uh, very successful over the last few years. It's yielded um, you know, some of the strongest statistical guarantees for a variety of inverse problems. Um, things like, you know, like tensor decomposition that I mentioned earlier, robust regression, uh, a variety of other problems that I'll just, I'll just sort of flash this laundry list uh, to give it to you. Um, okay, so, so how does this framework really work? Um, so here's, let me start with sort of like a bad idea, which is instead of finding a solution to this polynomial system, which I, you know, that seems intractable, maybe let me try to find some kind of probability distribution over solutions. Maybe that's easier. Like, uh, of course, this is, this is no easier because if I had a probability distribution over solutions that I could sample from, then I could just come up with a single solution. I could just you know, sample from the distribution and I would get a solution. So of course this idea doesn't work, but the driving force behind sum of squares is really a further relaxation of this idea. So instead of finding an actual distribution over solutions, sum of squares does something kind of strange. It finds a solution, it finds something that behaves like a uh, distribution over solutions, but only when you measure it with respect to low degree test functions. Okay, so there is some, you know, uh, some technical definition for what it means to be a fake distribution. The technical details here aren't super important, but uh, sort of the, the main idea is that this distribution has to satisfy certain coherence checks that a real distribution would satisfy. So for instance, it has to satisfy things like linearity of expectation. It certainly has to satisfy that if I pass in, you know, like I ask, what is the expectation of uh, a non-negative polynomial? It had better output to something that's non-negative as its expectation. Um, and the nice thing is that this collection of fake distributions, which I'll call pseudo distributions or pseudo expectations, this is actually a convex object. And so the upshot is you can actually search for pseudo expectations over solutions uh, efficiently using say semi-definite programming. So why is this useful for us? The final idea is that if my proof of correctness is simple in some sense, in the sense that every step could actually be derived as some low degree polynomial inequality. For instance, something like Cauchy-Schwartz or something like Folger's inequality applied at low degree. Then the point is that if I take those polynomial inequalities and I hit both sides with the pseudo expectation operator, the inequality still holds. And so because I proved in a simple fashion that Q hat A is equal to Q of A uh, using these low degree polynomial inequalities. If I hit both sides of this with pseudo expectation, then I still get that the pseudo expectation of Q hat A is equal to Q of A. So why is this useful? Well, let me just give you like the, you know, a two line algorithm that, that solves our problem using this proof of identifiability. The algorithm is simply, I take as input my, my, you know, my moment quantities, these trace terms, and I just run semi-definite programming to find in polynomial time, this pseudo distribution over solutions. And then the second line of the algorithm is simply, I take my pseudo distribution and I compute the pseudo expectations of my variables. And what I've concluded was that these pseudo expectations are precisely the ground truth, the, the, the matrices we wanted to recover. And so that's it, that's the algorithm. Um, 
the only thing that I really owe you, which, uh, which uh, is a bit out, outside of the scope of the stock, is that this proof of identifiability can really be implemented in this kind of proof system where you only use low degree polynomial inequalities. But hopefully this, um, this argument that I described earlier where we were really only using sort of elementary algebraic manipulations, hopefully you're convinced that this can actually be implemented in a simple fashion. Have you proved that's the case? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so in the paper, we, we sort of uh, phrase it in terms of these polynomial inequality steps. Yeah. Great, so th that's, that's the entire algorithm. Um, the, so I think the main takeaway, hopefully, uh, if you get nothing out of this talk is that, um, you know, sum of squares is really uh, this kind of black box that allows you to reduce the sort of creativity of algorithm design to creativity in, you know, in the analysis of a particular um, sort of purely information theoretic question. And the only constraints is that the kinds of steps you can use have to be in terms of these polynomial inequalities. Okay, so I wanted to mention a bit about um, the higher degree case, um, but I think I'm running a bit low on time. So let me, um, let me just conclude with takeaways. And if people are interested during Q&A, I can, I can talk about uh, the higher degree case. Um, okay, so let me just conclude with some, some open questions and some takeaways. Um, so, you know, one natural question that arises in the higher degree case is, you know, we made this kind of extra assumption that the tensors involved were somehow bounded rank, right? And you can ask, well, this is, I mean, this is certainly useful when it comes to algorithm design, but is it actually uh, either information theoretically or computationally necessary for a parameter recovery? And I suspect the answer is no, that there should be an algorithm that lifts this, that, that does away with this bounded rank assumption. So that's just a purely technical question you can ask. Um, so the million dollar question really should be, you know, are there more practical algorithms uh, for these problems? Certainly in practice, there are such algorithms, um, but are there algorithms that, you know, you could, you know, similarly hope to run in practice, but which come with these kinds of certificates of correctness, right? Um, now, the drawback of using sum of squares is that I really think of it as like the first step in the sort of uh, timeline of, you know, the lifespan of uh, the algorithmic complexity of a problem, sum of squares is really like the first sort of proof, um, sort of prototype algorithm that shows that this problem in some sense is tractable. But typically how sum of squares works is that, you know, a few years later, people tend to extract out of these proofs of identifiability, not just this sort of black box sum of squares algorithm, but some kind of uh, spectral object, maybe some, some low rank tensor or low rank matrix that uh, one can run some simple algorithm like principal component analysis to recover the underlying parameters uh, for your problem. So the hope is that uh, the sum of squares algorithm will be like uh, sort of a stepping stone towards more practical, say, spectral algorithms. Um, another natural question you can ask is, you know, as I said, polynomial activations tend to generate fairly blurry images, definitely not of the kind of quality that you see with these state-of-the-art GANs in practice. And so, uh, you know, a pressing question is really understanding for activation functions that are more popularly, more commonly used in practice, like the ReLU, can we get similar guarantees? And um, actually one recent work of ours shows that at least in a worst case sense, this uh, can be quite hard. Uh, so this is joint work with Jerry Lee and Rianzo Lee. We showed that if I replace my polynomial activations with ReLU activations, then in a certain query complexity model called the, the SQ model or the statistical query model, we show that there's actually no polynomial time algorithm for an even sort of more general question. So here the goal is not parameter recovery, but something um, which, you know, parameter recovery implies. Namely, I'd like an algorithm that takes those samples, you know, uh, sam samples from my true distribution and outputs an arbitrary distribution, which is close to the true distribution. So in other words, I don't even need to output the exact parameters of the true distribution. I just need to output some distribution which is close in a statistical sense. And what we show in this negative result is that actually for this, this, this easier question, there is still computational hardness. I should, I should stress that you know, earlier in the slides, I showed that there was already some kind of hardness result uh, for parameter recovery. Um, but the point is that that result was only if you cared about exactly recovering the parameters of the distribution. In this case, for this easier question of just recovering some distribution, we show that you actually still need super polynomial uh, amount of time in order to solve this problem. And this is specific to radial activations. 
Of course, you could ask, is there a corresponding hardness for this easier problem, even for polynomial activations? Um, and this actually uh, surprisingly turns out to be much harder because polynomial activations aren't as good at generating these kinds of um, certain moment matching constructions that are needed in the very loop setting. Okay, but that's again, some technical question. Um, I think one interesting direction that uh, from a conceptual standpoint that all of this uh, stuff about deep generative models suggests is that typically in theory, we're really you know, focused on understanding distribution learning from this traditional statistical standpoint, where we'd like to really you know, uh, find something that's close either in parameter distance or in Wasserstein distance, total variation distance, what have you. But you know, the success of things like GANs suggests that maybe you know, distribution learning is overkill in some sense, and that really we should strive for something, uh, a weaker guarantee where we don't want to learn statistical distance so much as some kind of computational distance. So instead of trying to fool all, let's say, one Lipschitz functions in the setting of Wasserstein, we're trying to fool all possible events um, over, your, over your measure space in the case of total variation, um, maybe we just want to fool all computationally bounded adversaries. And maybe this is simply a, you know, a, an easier goal to begin with. Of course, as we saw with this uh, discussion about pseudorandom generators earlier, this goal of learning and computational distance isn't exactly aligned with distribution learning because we could come up with simply a pseudorandom generator instead of the true distribution over the, over the, the images. Um, uh, but I think this is an interesting goal to strive towards. Um, and ideally, you know, a great result would be something like in a setting where statistical distance is hard to learn in, you can still learn in computational distance. Um, I should mention that this is actually something that's already been studied in the fairness literature under the name of outcome indistinguishability. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so there are many open questions in this area that I'm, I'm happy to you know, discuss offline with uh, people who are interested. Um, just to include with takeaways, um, you know, uh, the first should be just be that push forwards are you know, a very powerful way of modeling high dimensional distributions in practice, but very little is known from a theoretical standpoint, especially from an algorithmic standpoint with respect to provable guarantees, not just for learning, but even for evaluating how well your trained models have done. I think that uh, a variety of tools and perspectives from TCS um, are well suited to fill this gap. Things that we've already mentioned, like pseudorandom generators, smooth analysis, method of moments, convex programming hierarchies, what have you. Um, by building on these ideas, we give sort of a first step in this program by giving the first efficient algorithms for provably learning a natural family of push forward distributions. And again, there are tons of open questions on both the technical and conceptual fronts um, that. Uh, uh, I'm excited to explore. All right, so uh, thanks a lot for listening, uh, and thanks again for the inv invitation to speak here. Well, thank you very much, Sitan, for a beautiful introduction to this subject. I think I'll stop your screen sharing so that we can okay. see people. And for comments, I hope that people will turn on their video so we can talk to each other face to face. Maybe I could just start by asking. Uh, it was very nice, by the way, to see some pictures and that fits into our picture language seminar. But do you have, in the higher degree case, any algorithm to uh, give a pseudo expectation? Yes, yes. Um, so the, yeah, so I, sorry for, for skipping over that, that section, but the framework is actually um, uh, almost identical to the quadratic case, apart from, of course, the proof of identifiability. Um, so in the higher degree case, yeah. So the nice thing about sum of squares is that there's really this like, I, so I didn't I, I didn't go into details about this, but there's sort of like this lever that you're the, like this knob that you can turn to increase the complexity of your algorithm almost for free. And that's the degree of the pseudo expectation. Um, so typically the constraint is, you know, I want to implement my proof in some low degree fashion and how high of a degree really dictates the runtime of, of the sum of squares algorithm. Um, and in general, you know, because, you know, there are the, the number of monomial scales exponentially in the degree, um, the, the exponent in the runtime will correspond to the degree. And this is why um, in the case of learning higher degree push forwards, we need to make this constraint that the, the ranks of the tensors are bounded um, because ultimately the degree, we end up reasoning about sort of relaxations of tensor rank in terms of you know, minors of certain contractions of the tensor. Um, and you know, because we're working with rank L, we expect that we'll end up using minors of order L plus one and as a result, we need to run in time exponential in the rank. So, but yes, we, we end up also using set pseudo expectations there. Thank you. 
So are there any other comments? So I hope that everybody hasn't digested everything you've said. And <laughs> yeah. There are no other questions or comments. So, so can I ask a question? <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Um, so for the push forward representation of the of the distribution, like the Gaussian distribution, yeah. So can this method be generalized to quantum case, like the push forward representation of the a quantum state or like a distribution of quantum state? Oh, um, that's definitely not an angle we we we've thought about. Uh, I, I should mention. Okay, so at least from a from a classical perspective, the techniques are fairly flexible in terms of so often, oftentimes in, in the TCS literature, uh, the very like delicate algebraic properties are used about Gaussians when, whenever they're invoked in learning theory. Um, in our case, um, the nice thing is that in generative modeling, like you have full control over the C distribution that you're working with. Um, and so you might as well use any, I mean, if you wanted to use any rotation invariant distribution, like uh, it's, it's sort of reasonable to assume that you have access to that distribution. And so really, you know, these, these results do at least extend in some greater generality to rotation invariant distributions. I'm mm -hmm. not so sure about quant, like, yeah, about distributions over quantum states, but um, yeah, I, I think that's also a great motivation um, to uh, yeah, a great direction to, to study, but I, I don't have anything intelligent to say there. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And also, when you consider about like the the gam, like the, yes. what assumption do you have on the like the capacity of the discrimination? The discrimination. Oh, you mean for the um the pseudo random generator stuff, like the, the yeah, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. Again, it's it's um we're only assuming like the weights are bounded or are polynomially bounded. Like it's just all the relevant parameters are sort of polynomially bounded. Like at a high level, the idea is the following: is that um. Um, you know, for pseudo-ram generators, the, the natural notion of discriminator is the collection of all polynomial size Boolean circuits, mm -hmm. polynomial depth and size. Um, and, and in the proof, we're essentially just trying to implement these kinds of Boolean circuits using ReLU networks. Um, at least that already gives you, like, if I, if I only care about input distributions given by, say, uniform bits rather than Gaussian, this almost for free gives you a, a proof in that case. Um, so whatever networks you can sort of um, you know, capture using Boolean circuits, like that, that's sort of like the complexity class we're working with. Um, and of course, like to extend to Gaussian, there are some other. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks for questions. So are there any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank Sitan again for a very beautiful talk and uh, look forward to your future results. Lots Thanks of so problems. Interesting. Thank Thanks you. So this was lots of fun. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.